morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are joining us today. And thank you very much for tuning in. Whether you are new to the global female leaders community or you have been with us for a long time now, a very warm welcome to this virtual meetup that we are proud to host under the roof of the Global Female Leaders Summit, which is the annual International Economic Forum for Female Executives. Leading change and making a difference, that is our topic today, and I am thrilled and honored to welcome our esteemed guest, Professor Helga Rubzamchev, who is not only a remarkable scientist, but also a very successful and accomplished entrepreneur and business leader. To properly introduce our guests, as well as to moderate this um, conversation, I am delighted to welcome Professor Annabel Tennis von Hartburg, who is also an impressive entrepreneur. But before I hand over to Annabel Tennis, please allow me to say a few words about her. Professor Tennis is one of the leading minds for the digital future. She is an engaged social and digital impact entrepreneur, a futurologist, and an expert in sustainability and health management. Professor Tennis serves on several boards, such as the board of directors of the British Chamber of Commerce in Germany and the Bitcoin Task Force Work 4.0, and she chairs the board of trustees of the Flexible Working World Foundation. Professor Tennis is also the managing director um, of the uh, Institute for Sustainable Management, also Director of Future Strategy at the Berlin University of Applied Sciences, and she holds a professorship in International Business Administration. And last but not least, Professor Tennis is author of more than 50 books, and she writes for major global magazines like Focus Magazine and Forbes. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I am now turning over to Professor Annabel Tennis and Professor Hübsam Schiff. Welcome, ladies, and on to the conversation. Thank you very much, Laura, for the introduction. I'm very happy to um, be the presenter today in the interview with um, Professor Hübsam Schiff. And I would like to start uh, with the introduction of her. So starting with the introduction of her in reference to the topic of leading change and making a difference, um, I would like to start with her exciting biography. As a chemist by training and a virologist um, and an entrepreneur, having de developed um, breakthrough medicines against infectious diseases, you are indeed a change maker and that impacts the lives of many, many people. I'm very happy to have you here. And I think also the whole audience is uh, really awaiting to, to hear more about you. We do realize just, um, just one or two things about you that we'll, we will not find in the internet and not in your biography. Well, maybe, uh, Annabelle, um, it's my architect's dreams. Um, I know that from, from my father's side, I'm coming from a family of architects and engineers, and my father wanted me to become an architect. And apparently those genes are extremely strong. I remodel or rebuild every house that I get, can get a hold on, <laughs> including the, the building of the company. That sounds indeed very interesting because in architecture, I think it's more than just building rooms. It's also building atmospheres and um, yeah, building something which fits for the content, right? Definitely. And, and I think uh, also in terms of companies, you know, if, if the rooms are nice, um, I think people will enjoy working much more than, than if it's just a very plain room and simple room. Yeah. And have you ever thought about also moving into this direction of architecture or was it just um, always a kind of hobby? It's, it's a hobby. It's a hobby. But I think, you know, looking at, at what I've done in the past, um, had I studied it, I, I think I could have been successful. <laughs> I'm very sure about this. <laughs> um, what inspires you to go about um, out every day? Um, in fact, what does your typical day look like? So are there typical things which are characterizing every day? Do we have special habits you want to share with us? I really like my work uh, and I'm curious. I think these are two things that motivate me very much. Presently, I'm uh, in the supervisory board of uh, several companies, including the company that I founded, iCurious. Um, I advise the German government for certain health topics. Um, I have a number of functions in research and development uh, committees. 
this is a more scientific function, of course. And I try to help the dissemin dissemination of knowledge to the general public um, by also giving interviews. So it's, it's a rather broad activity. And last but not least, I'm just finishing up editing a book on how to make drugs against viruses. I think a very up-to-date topic. Oh, well, that sounds in indeed very impressive, and um, I think interesting to um, to maybe also more more discussion later uh, later on. Um, I would now come to your entrepreneurship journey, and uh, would like to talk more about your science field. Um, so you come from the science field, and you had a corporate position at Bayer before founding iCurs. What drove you to start iCurs? Well, very simple. Um, at Bayer, I was responsible for the whole of the infectious disease uh, research, and uh, Bayer decided to stop this work. I was shocked because I said, in a globalized world, uh, you need people who can deal with infectious diseases, and I think today we very clearly see why. Um, but then Bayer said the decision was made, but if I wanted, I could found my own company. I would need to find the money for it, which was about 120 million uh, euros that I needed. Um, but I was able um, to find people to sponsor this work. And so I found it I curious, simply because it was, uh, I was very convinced that I needed to do this. Was it, your, was it your dream beforehand to start an own company? I mean, it sounds a little bit like you took the a situa you took the effort out of the situation and said, okay, I have to, because it needs to be done. But uh, was it beforehand your dream to, to start something on your own? No, not really. Um, um, I, I'd never dreamt when I was 18 years old, I would have never dreamt of founding a company. So this was really due to the situation. But on the other hand, I must say it was the best decision in my professional life that I took. It, it really meant taking an opportunity. And I'm, I'm really glad I did it. Was it sometimes somehow a, a feeling that you said, uh, it's going over my head? Um, or was it always that your engagement um, for the topic was overwhelming the whole and giving you also the confidence to, to manage it? I think what you said, uh, being very engaged uh, uh, and convinced that the, the um, mission of this new company was very important was one thing. The other thing was that I was able from Bayer to take uh, um, people with me at work with me at Bayer. We were 22 at the beginning and we formed a very close group, you know, and helped each other. And it was a very intense time. But as I said, uh, uh, at the same time, people really were blooming because all of a sudden they could uh, take more decisions. Uh, they, they could work more freely than you normally work at a, at a big enterprise, you know. So it was a very different uh, atmosphere we had. And that meant it, it was a lot of fun. On the other hand, um, you know, in the beginning, at least, um, you know, I went to the company and I had a plan what to do today. And then I had to throw it over because something else was more urgent. So I decided very early, and I think that's advice I would give in such a situation, um, that uh, I would hire a interim manager who would take all the administrative stuff from me so that, that I could concentrate on the, on the projects. Um, we all had to learn a lot, you know, we never developed clinically. We never tested a, a drug clinically in humans. So we had to learn how to do this and what the conditions are you need to obey. And, and therefore, I really wanted someone else to look after everything else. And I think that, again, was a very important and right decision at that time. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important point uh, what you're saying because it's um, it, it shows also that you knew what uh, yeah, what you could do very well and uh, why you could hire somebody who could do it even better in this that you can concentrate on on the things you are excellent in no? yeah. and I think uh, if people think they can do on everything they they never can do everything the same it's, it's the same in a good way so it's always good to have somebody um, who knows what you're good in or where you're better better in. And and I, I think it's, it's very important to decide, you know, what do you want to concentrate in on your work and what can others do? <laughs> I think that's a, that, that's a very important decision everyone must make, because as you said, you, no one can do everything, particularly not when you just start a company. <laughs> You don't, have phone, you don't have computers, you, you have to decide all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. 
Um, exactly. And uh, have you ever felt like a real startup or company or was it always, as you said, you started with 22 people, that it was always a kind of, um, yeah, experts you had around you, uh, that it was more, uh, yeah, I say, uh, instead of a cross ship, um, a fast moving, um, a fast moving boat, but not a startup, which, which has to settle first and put the things together and are quite new in some areas. I mean, for everyone in the new company, um, as I said, it meant learning a lot because we had to do things we hadn't done before. We in, before we invented the drug, but then gave it to Lisa Bayer, um, who helped to, to develop it uh, for human use. Um, on the other hand, I must say that those colleagues, uh, even after we were spun out and had formed the new company, were still extremely helpful. So that was another thing um, in the contract that I made when the spin-off was formed. I put in a, a clause that Bayer had to work for us for a year and a half. So the old teams remained together. And that, of course, meant that uh, we had a lot of help in the, in the start. We paid them for the Bayer colleagues, but it was fine. And they were very enthusiastic to help us get started. I think that is a so very important point. I think also a very important message here. <laughs> Yeah, in, indeed. Of course, sometimes it's a small little details which make a difference. And um, knowing that you can um, lay on somebody who stayed there for one and a half years helps for sure, even for the beginning, when you know that you uh, that every important um, content you, you provide is staying there and developing there together in the team. What prepared you to become successful? Do you need, can you can you share a few more ideas? What 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 became, what made you successful in the entrepreneurial sphere? Well, um, I think another important thing is that uh, in a new company, um, you must make sure that if things go wrong and things will go wrong, this is just <laughs> a normal thing, you know, that you are the first to learn about them because otherwise you can't influence anything. So we had the rule: if anything goes go, goes wrong, I'm the first to hear about it. <laughs> and uh, we also had, uh, for example, in the beginning. Um, every Thursday morning, we had breakfast together. And so everyone could say what went well last week, what went wrong, what, is there anything that we should be discussing together? And that was again, very helpful. I mean, this culture of accepting failures, accepting mistakes, but at the same time, try to fix them as quickly as you can, I think is, is, is very important also. I think so too. And this brings me to the next question. Um, what has helped you to get to where you are, um, being a woman at the forefront of the fight against infectious diseases? I mean, maybe it's not really one competence, maybe it's, it's a bunch of several things, but can you, can you share a few things with us? Well, I think um, one thing that drives me is my curiosity. I wouldn't have been a scientist otherwise. <laughs> um, and at the same time, uh, I really wish to do something meaningful. That's meaningful for, for many people. And then if you start a company, I think what is also very important is having a vision where you want to go, um, but remaining realistic at the same time and keep cross-checking on the way as you, as you move and as you develop the company, um, are we still on the right track? Do we need to correct something, uh, et cetera? So I think the vision, of course, is the most important thing. If you just do your work without a vision, then the company will not bloom. Um, but if you uh, just have a vision and you don't cross-check, um, is, is the reality <laughs> really uh, what, what you think uh, it is, you know, uh, then you may run quickly into mistakes and errors um, uh, that, that can kill the company. So I think both is, is important. Mm -hmm. Right, I completely agree. I completely agree with you. Um, if you have to say in a few words um, an advice to young women which are standing at the start of uh, their career and you want to give them something on their path, um, what what they should do in their career to succeed very much, whether wherever they are, uh, what would you uh, give them as an advice or as a few uh, few ideas? I think it's important that at the beginning of a career, and that of course applies to men as well as women, um, that you decide what you want to do. I mean, when I was 18, I didn't know it. <laughs> and I studied chemistry because I didn't know chemistry. And I was curious what chemistry would be. <laughs> and obviously, it was very hard at the beginning. But then after a few years, I more and more felt that I wouldn't stay in classical chemistry. I was more curious towards uh, life sciences and, and medicine. Uh, and so I arrived where I'm now. So as soon as you have the feeling where you want to go, um, get, get, get it clear in your head and then go for it. 
Uh, and simply, um, I think it's important to f follow one's intuition. What mm. would you like to do? You know, if you, if you go every morning uh, to work and you hate it, that's not going to work well. And you really have to try and figure out what can you do well, what do you like to do, and then when you are successful, this motivates you, of course, uh, in addition. I think these are very important points because we often know what we dislike, but uh, we are often not that good in knowing what we mm -hmm. like or want to, to go for. And um, I think intuition is also something in a digitalized world, which is really fast moving. Um, it's sometimes hard to concentrate on yourself, um, even when you have so many things around telling you what you should do, can do, or um, what others do. But you know, maybe sometimes you need to take a day and retreat and sit just in your office or at home, whatever, and think. What is it that I read? I mean, this is, for example, what I did when, when Bayer said, we want to, to stop your work. Um, and I really took a day, it was even two, um, do I really want to do it and how do I do it? Mm -hmm. and, you know, with no one else around, just yourself uh, and you decide it for yourself. I think that's important so that you are not influenced by other uh, opinions um, that in the end probably don't fit to you. I think this is a good advice. And I think nowadays more than ever, um, success is also something which is dominated often um, by things around, where it's often important to look into yourself what success means to you, because this is not a not a um, not something which you can uh, which is uh, the same for everybody. What does success mean to you? When I interrupt you, I think it's a very important point that you just say: if you want to be successful, what else do you need? You need power, and it may well be that your surrounding is not that you get the power that you need if you really want to move things and and be creative and change things. Um, and so I think it's it's also very important to. Always look, um, where can I really influence things? How can I get power in what I want to do? And, and not accept jobs that, that are not really powerful, that, that don't bring anything further. So I think uh, having power, and often women don't want power, but, but I think that's a mistake. If you want to change something, you really need power. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important to know because sometimes jobs sounds powerful, but they aren't. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the job description or the title is like this, but um, yes, and I also experienced that a lot of women don't want to take this because uh, they're frightened to stay in the front um, and uh, stand for their own opinions. Um, you, you already said with this word, I think a little bit what success means to you, but do you want to concretize a little bit um, what success means to you and what are its rewards and its perks for you? Well, um, I think it's quite simple. I enjoy success and I love to win. <laughs> but once I have accomplished something, uh, I always ask, now what's next? <laughs> so, so I don't sit around, you know, that's, that's, but that's my own, uh, how can I say, that's the way I'm made, you know. <laughs> Yes, and I think, I mean, uh, what I found, you already said it, um, that it's sometimes hard to be an entrepreneur because you have to go through these ups and downs and you have to, uh, I mean, learning or going through the to the ups, that's easy, but um, or often easy, but um, going through the downs is sometimes hard. Um, how do you deal with this and, uh, and maintain a cool head by this? Well, I think it's important um, to realize um, that there will be ups and downs. So to anticipate that not everything will go the easy way and the straight way. Uh, for example, we had at Icuris uh, a very important clinical trial that did not recruit any patients. So I went to the investigators and said, why don't you include any patients in our trial? And they explained to me why and said, Jesus, we have totally wrongly uh, designed that trial. We have to stop it immediately and redesign it. You know, that was a hard lecture, <laughs> but uh, it was the right thing to do, you know. And, and once you decide that you need to change something, it's easy to change it. You, you then have the will and, and you, you, you can change it, you know. So, um, and, and I think, if you, if you believe that nothing is going to go the easy way all the time, and this is reality, um, then if you have a failure or a problem arises, then I think you don't get too nervous. You simply think, all right, that's again something I need to solve, you know? And, and you always see failures also as, as something on the learning curve, you know? Mm -hmm. When I designed uh, our next uh, uh, big trial, this was done much better, you know, because then I needed 
then I knew what I needed to look for. And I discussed much more intensively before finalizing the design with the investigators, the, the physicians who would then treat the patients. Have we done everything right? Or have you ideas how to change things, etc.? So I, I think uh, a failure is a failure, yes, but it's always an opportunity to learn. And, and therefore, I was never too depressed, you know, I was angry, yes, <laughs> but never, never depressed. But I said, hey, we, we need to move and change something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you behave with your, with your team in moments like this um, where you feel, feel angry or when you feel happy about a small little win? Um, what means leadership there for you and how, do you, how, have, you, you know, how have you driven this? Well, I, I did express my disappointment um, mm -hmm. when, for example, the trial uh, didn't work. And in the beginning in the company, we always uh, discuss issues like this um, with the whole team. And, and so we sat around the table and, and I said, well, I think the next step is we need to ask the doctors why they don't put patients in, into our trial. We must have done something wrong, you know? And then I said, okay, I'll call a meeting and who wants to come? Um, and, and so, you know, the moment you, I think you lead, and I think this is leadership. Uh, the moment you, you say, all right, we have, we have seen there's a mistake or a problem. Um, and the moment you then pick up and say, okay, we'll do this, that, and that. Then the team is behind you. And I think that's important. They expect you to make a decision and, and to, to say the way where to go. Of course, you, you involve them in making that decision. And you hear if someone says, hey, nee, I don't believe that's the right way to go. But um, once this is discussed, you know, and you give the reasons why you then think there's only one way we find out. We have to ask those guys. <laughs> then, then everyone will believe it. Um, maybe a further question to this, um, of course, I think it's really important when, um, I mean, you, you already said the team is really important. Um, what is your style of leadership? Um, it sounded like you're very, um, very much team oriented and uh, you're open to your team. Can you, um, can you explain it maybe also with a small, um, yeah, in a small experience with your team? Yeah. As I said, I think it's important to involve everyone, to hear everyone, so that you uh, you never know everything yourself. <laughs> so you need to get different opinions and, and uh, views. Um, but I think the team then expects you as a leader, and we are talking about leadership, that uh, a decision be made and um, that uh, that decision uh, should be followed uh, efficiently. And if it turns out that the decision was wrong and things have to be have to be changed again, then they expect you to explain why. And mm -hmm. I think if you do that, um, then they will accept your leadership. Because mm -hmm. I mean, unless things go drastically wrong, which never happened to me, fortunately. <laughs> but um, I, I, I do think that if you want to be a leader, you have to lead. You can't just ask the team, what do you, do you think? You have to, to weigh arguments and to say, well, I weigh this more than others, uh, other things. And because of this weighing of this, the discussion, I believe we should do the following. Yeah. And they expect it. Yeah, thank you. You're also not only a leader of your team or have been a, le a leader of your team, but you are also a news leader um, coming to the topic of coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. So you're a newsworthy person. I know that you appear in a lot of media on television, etc., especially today as you're a vir virologist. Um, what's the question you are the most tired of hearing on the subject and what would you like to say about it so you never have to answer it again? The question I'm really tired about is when is it over? <laughs> because um, I'm convinced it will never be over, but um, so, so we'll have to learn to live with the virus and we'll have to improve our tools to deal with it. I mean, it is absolutely great that within less than a year, we have the first uh, vaccines. There are now more very good vaccines coming up, but I don't think that we'll ever get 100% of the population vaccinated. Not everyone will react well enough to the vaccine, etc. So there will always be people that we need to protect from the virus. And as I said, the virus will stay. It will keep mutating. It will keep trying to be more efficient in infecting us, etc. And therefore, I'm, I'm very much fighting for um, making new drugs against the virus, direct uh, drugs against the virus, like we did it in the HIV field. In HIV, if you remember, uh, it was not possible to this date to make a vaccine for this particular virus. But here, that sentence could be changed into 
a lifelong treatment um, where people can, can lead nearly normal lives and, and can get the usual age uh, that they normally would get by drugs. And I think this is the side we have forgotten or not, not emphasized enough uh, in the corona uh, discussion and where we urgently need to, to really do something about it. And once we've done that, I think we can handle it much more better. Um, do you think we are really prepared for a future pandemic when you're saying this? Well, this is a discussion uh, that the German government has at the moment where I'm involved as well. What do we need to do to prepare better for future pandemics? I mean, you can try and make drugs um, against, for example, coronaviruses. Coronavirus is a large family of virus, and the next coronavirus may come from the next bat <laughs> and infect humans. And if you take um, structures of those viruses that are rather conserved among different uh, species of, of, of this whole group of viruses, um, then you may have uh, uh, the drug against the coronavirus one or, or the present the virus two and when three comes uh, your drug may still be somewhat active against it on the other thing i think these drugs will never be perfect so you will still need to optimize them and therefore i think we need a very strong infectious disease work and a strong scientific community and um, as you have seen this time um, the corona pandemic will only be solved by science and so I think this is a very important thing to also appreciate for the community that um, a good basic science, and then at the same time, small biotech companies who quickly turn the science into a product, like for example, Biontech, the German company Biontech did. Um, that's the way to go about it. We will not be able to exclude future pandemics. I don't think so. But if we have a strong scientific basic research and strong companies, uh, who can, can turn this basic research quickly into products, mm. then I think that's the best we can do. That's right. And I hope you will play, play there a really crucial role. <laughs> um, <laughs> coming back to a female entrepreneurship um, and to the and, uh, and an effect of COVID, research suggested that the economic impact on the pandemic has been suffered to a greater degree by women and especially by women business owners or female entrepreneurs because of the home situation, um, the digital situation. Um, the resultant crisis is so bad that it has been even been referred to as a she cashing by business analysis. What is your take on the situation um, being yourself a female entrepreneur? Yeah, I think that indeed, uh, some women have been very badly affected. It has not hit me, I must say, uh, because my son has grown up, so I didn't have to take care of children <laughs> apart from, from schooling them, apart from doing my work. But I think what women should be doing now is, is really make sure that they get the, get the support by kindergarten and schools um, that they need. And, and, that, uh, and I'm very much saying that we cannot close schools again. We cannot close kindergarten again. Uh, this is simply not, not bearable. And maybe women must even uh, more ask from their partners, if there are partners, uh, to, to share that work. I, I do have the feeling that in the past, women, like in the very old past, <laughs> took over this, this function again, being a mother and, and schooling them, etc. cetera. But um, I think now it's time to put your foot down and say, hey, guys, you must help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. And do you have ideas on who should be the driver of this? Is it a, a female entrepreneurship a movement or are they it's an NGOs or is it the politics which should uh, drive that further or is there needed a special organization? What do you think? I'm not sure what really, I think every woman must fight for her own ideas and her own situation and, and try to improve it. Um, and of course, when we are in a circle like this one today, Mm -hmm. uh, we can exchange uh, ideas and one lady he, in this call today will say, oh, that's an idea that I could pick up, but another one will say, no, that wouldn't work for me. So I think exchanging ideas is, 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 is very important, but at the same time, every lady herself should make her decision and really, if needed, put her foot down and, and get the help she, she, she really needs. Yeah, I think that's a big, a big, um, a big point. That's not not just talking, acting. Um, what do you think are the greatest barriers for women to become entrepreneurs? I think in a in a small sentence, you already mentioned something. Could you repeat this? I didn't quite get what you said. 
Uh, what are the greatest barriers to, for women to become entrepreneurs? In a small sentence beforehand, you already mentioned something. Yeah, um, I think sometimes they don't dare. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've ex experienced personally. I had two ladies um, that I, at Bayer that I really liked very well. They were great scientists and I wanted them to, uh, to follow me uh, in the small company and they didn't dare to do that. Um, so I was very disappointed, I must say, but th that, of course, was their decision, and, and I, I uh, accepted the decision. But I do think that women still are not uh, educated, or I don't know what the reason is, what, what hinders them from, from becoming entrepreneurs, but, but they still have a tendency of rather not doing it than doing it. And from my own experience, um, I can only say um, raising your own company is, is a great, uh, great thing and it's a lot of work, but also a lot of fun and, and uh, very rewarding in the end. So I can only uh, yeah, say, try it, do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's right. I think it's important to just uh, be brave and sometimes it's um, less, less talk and just acting. No? And I yeah. think an organization like this, uh, which is giving the frame today to us, is also a great, um, yeah, great fundamental um, possibility uh, to get, get along with many other uh, women as a role models or as a colleague to get exchanged and get ideas and get maybe more brave to, to act and um, start your own journey to be more successful and take over more power, right? I think having role models and, and seeing it can be done, you know, I think is, is also important. And, and um, exchanging ideas like we do today is certainly going to help this process. And it was interesting when, when I founded the company, I, of course, guys and girls in, in the group. And, and the guy said, all right, we'll do it. We'll make it. <laughs> and the girl said, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Did we uh, um, make that contract? Uh, shall we uh, discuss once more, etc.? So they were much more um, careful. Uh, they did very particulate work, while the guys were not worried about it, you know, and, and they were convinced they would make it. You know? <laughs> so it is a different attitude. And as to this day, I don't know if we are born like this or if we are educated like this. But if you want to become an entrepreneur, you simply have to forget this attitude. You have to go for it and do it, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That brings us um, to our conclusion here. And with respect to our topic, leading change and making a difference, is there anything we're leaving out um, here that needs to be addressed in this, um, in this audience? Um, yeah, what I said in between, I think, uh, be very clear about that if you want to change things, you need power. And um, you may sometimes uh, get a job offer that sounds great, but if you then think about it, you see it's not really very powerful and, and you won't really be able to, to change much. Um, on the other hand, um, what happened to me before I joined Bayer, I was offered uh, to become director of an uh, academic institute in Frankfurt that was totally run down. Yeah? We, had, we had just three positions and a very low budget. Um, and I said, okay, that's probably um, a job that no man wants to do because uh, therefore they offer it to me. <laughs> But the institute was close to the university clinics. It had 6,000 square meters of lab space. And I said, but you can, you can create something here. And, and so I took it. And, and so I, I think whenever you're offered something, um, try to figure out what you can create out of it or if it's really a dead end. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's very important because if you don't develop the power you want, you won't move much. Mm -hmm. Again, make clear to yourself that... Um, People expect leadership from you if you if you are the boss of, of an, an enterprise or of, a, of a, an organization. People do expect leadership. And that often is a, a narrow balance between uh, chaos <laughs> and division, you know. I mean, you always have to, to, to keep this, this track, you know, and that's your job, you know. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really good main message. Um, and that brings us now to the uh, next part. Uh, we have already the first questions are waiting for you. So the first question is in the current pandemic, how do you think we should prepare for the variants and possible next steps regarding vaccines and protocols, policies and different age groups? 
Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, companies are already doing this. Um, they have already made vaccines against, uh, for example, the Delta variant. There is presently discussion um, with the American Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control whether um, to vaccinate a third time now. So you have been vaccinated twice with, a, with AstraZeneca or another vaccine. And then the question is, a half a year is elapsed and is your protection still good enough? Sometimes it's not. So we see now breakthroughs. We see people who are vaccinated twice uh, who get the Delta variant. And so this discussion is ongoing. And Israel is already starting to vaccinate um, people who are vaccinated twice but have certain um, uh, diseases on top, for example, and they have been transplanted, the immune system uh, needs to be brought down, or um, they have diabetes, or they have a high body mass index, all those risk factors. And Israel is already starting to revaccinate these people a third time to, to protect their risk groups better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think currently we have no further question. Ah, there is one from Susan. Susan, do you want to go ahead directly? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rup Chef. It's a really interesting talk <clears throat> and um, very interesting to hear your views on um, how to, if you like, break away from a, a large uh, multi-level organization with its uh, uh, um, feelers in so many different areas and taking one particular stand and going with it and getting their support, which I congratulate you on. I'm quite sure I'm not alone in doing so. I'm interested in um, when you talked about um, the problem, the pandemic problem only being able to be solved by science. Um, some of my family live in the United States and uh, amongst that there is quite a discussion uh, in the US about the, um, <clears throat> the, the moral issue behind ownership of vaccine products or um, new uh, areas of vaccine, should these be products? Should these be, uh, um, uh, should these provide turnover for individual organizations or should it be as um, very often in the, uh, in the high tech or the, the new tech areas, um, where we, we talk about open source. Should these be open source and available to everybody? Should we have vaccines that are uh, created by, by some companies, but opened up to, uh, 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 to global manufacturing processes and made available on a global basis? Because if we don't um, vaccinate every- Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rup Chef. It's a really interesting talk <clears throat> and um, very interesting to hear your views on um, how to, if you like, break away from a, a large uh, multi-level organization with its uh, uh, um, feelers in so many different areas and taking one particular stand and going with it and getting their support, which I congratulate you on. I'm quite sure I'm not alone in doing so. I'm interested in um, when you talked about um, the problem, the pandemic problem only being able to be solved by science. Um, some of my family live in the United States and uh, amongst that there is quite a discussion uh, in the US about the, um, <clears throat> the, the moral issue behind ownership of vaccine products or um, new uh, areas of vaccine. Should these be products? Should these be uh, um, uh, should these provide turnover for individual organizations or should it be as um, very often in the uh, in the high tech or the, the new tech areas um, where we, we talk about open source, should these be open source and available to everybody? Should we have vaccines that are uh, created by, by some companies but opened up to uh, 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 to global manufacturing processes and made available on a global basis. Because if we don't um, vaccinate everybody, um, we will none of us be safe. Yeah, uh, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, if, I mean, the world population is now vaccinated, I think by maximum 50, 15, one, five percent. So that's really low and, and we are not nearly where we need to be. Um, the question um, that you ask also goes to the question, uh, shall we, take away patent protection from the companies who, who made certain vaccines. Now you must know that making these vaccines is an extremely expensive 
process and the company first needs to invest a lot. I mean, sometimes they get help from the state, that's, that's correct, but still they have invested a lot of money. And so it is always the, the intention of the company to first try and get that money back and to get even more back than they first invested because the vaccine needs to be evolved further. I just said that they already started to make vaccines against the Delta variant. And that of course needs to be tested as well. That again will cost millions of dollars to test. And unless you allow companies, I think, to do that, to make money, um, they will stop. And that of course will hinder every, every um, progress. On the other hand, what we see is that uh, companies tend to do the following. They tend to have high prices in the developed world to really get the return on their investment and the additional money to develop things further. Um, but then they are often willing to give very cheap licenses or even at, at zero uh, cost uh, to countries who, which don't have so much money. So those countries can make their own vaccine according to the protocol of the office, um, originator company. And I think that's a a reasonable um, way to, to, to really share uh, things in, in this world. I, I'm really strictly against um, uh, saying that intellectual property rights should fall because the companies need, need a certain protection also that they have a room where they can use their money and according to their mind, do what best is uh, for a new product. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Is there any further question? Um, Me, the hand rising, the hand rising from Almaz and Dazian. Yes. Hello, Ms. Rizam Schäfer. Thank you very much. It's very, very interesting to listen and to, to learn from you. I have one question when you are talking about women in leadership, exactly women in entrepreneurship. Um, I find out, I mean, statistics show us always uh, women have a lot of problems to get funding, to get money for their ideas, to bring it to the street and to create products or services. How did you uh, overcome this kind of challenge in the past? I think in the past was more, more bigger challenge than now, but we still have the challenge. How did you come over, overcome this uh, challenge and how do, what is your advice for us to go through this food process? Then what I said, you know, think it through what you want to do. And, and when I sat in my room and said, do you really want to create a company out of, uh, uh, with a pipeline that you created at Bayer and taking a few uh, colleagues with you, do you really want to do it? And I said, which projects would you take with you? And I said, all. Oh. And I said, then how much money do you need for that? And it was clear I needed 120 million over a period of five years. So it was from the beginning clear to me, I shouldn't even ask the help from the state. <laughs> I would have to find very unusual investors. And, and so on the one hand, I talked to smaller pharma companies that might be interested in entering the infectious disease space. Um, and we talked, for example, to a Japanese company. And then the funny thing happened, I sat in the evening and listened to the news and I heard that um, uh, two men, Strüngmann is their name, had sold their company Hexar, which made generic drugs, um, to Novartis, a big pharma company, and they had uh, received 5.6 billion from that. And I knew those guys. So I said, well, <laughs> why don't you call them and ask them if they give you the 120 million to start now after they made generics to start making innovative drugs, you know? And one of these drugs is now in the market and is very successful. So it all worked out. But I mean, this is exactly what you can see here. Um, not even try to go other ways where you know from the beginning you won't get that much money as you need. And I always also said to my team, if we don't get those 120 million, we will not start. So it was very, you know, very clear decision points from the beginning um, when we would do it. And, and if I, I didn't know how I would do it. <laughs> I also talked to, there were some Arab Emirates um, offices in, in, in Germany um, who wanted to have a long-term investment in Germany, et cetera. Um, but then, you know, after I had talked to Strömmans and they were interested, I simply said, no, then, then I don't need to, to look for anyone else. And, and it worked out with those uh, two, uh, two brothers. So they are now still 80% uh, owners of the company. It's also luck in this case. You know? <laughs> That means looking for the right cooperation partner for the beginning, from the start. Part of your, let me say. I mean, the Bayer at that time gave me a very renowned um, investment bank 
to help me find the investors, right? But then uh, they always said, but Ripsum, you have 13 projects, um, which one, which single one shall we fund? And I said, but you know, in pharma, you have to put 10 projects in human testing and only one will reach the market. And these 13 projects have not seen a human being yet. So if I now make a choice, it can very well be the wrong one. And the company is dead 90% from the beginning and I won't do that, you know? So I said, I need to have the money for the 120 million so that I can look at each of these 13 projects uh, to find out where is the raw diamond uh, that, it, that makes sense to invest further. And, and that's what I mean, you know, to, to very, very realistically think about it and, and understand your business and, and then make decisions. And what are the points that you need to, to achieve? And if you don't achieve it, maybe make the decision not to even start. I think that would have been a tough decision. Fortunately, we, hadn't, we didn't have to do it, but um, I was very determined that I would not go on a, on a journey with just money for one product. Wouldn't, wouldn't have made sense. Thank you very, very much, um, Professor Rübsam, Chef, um, for your really exciting, um, outstanding interview session here um, for the discussion. Thank you also very much to the audience for the interesting questions. Um, unfortunately, our time comes to an end. And I wish that we could talk longer and there's a, there's a chance to talk further with, uh, with you, um, Mrs. Rübsam, Chef. But um, thank you very much for taking the time. So at the end of this, I would like to um, point out first that um, there's a stream. So everybody who uh, wants to listen again and watch again the session can do it. Or you can also provide the message to further women who haven't had the time to watch it. Because I think it's, it's really also interesting to, to look at it once again or once further and um, join the community and follow on the social media. And stay, of course, tuned for the next virtual meetup. Of course, I found it really, really exciting and interesting also in my role as a presenter. So thank you again, Mrs. Rupsam Chef, for, for the time you take for um, answering my questions and the question of the audience. Thank you very much for the effort you put into this. And um, I hope you, you will, uh, we will hear a lot more from you because you're a great role model, I think, for many of us. Thank you. Also, um, from the organizing side, um, I would like to um, express um, our gratitude um, to everyone for joining us today and for the great questions. A massive thank you also to uh, Professor Rübsam Chef and um, to you, Professor Annabel Tennis, for the fascinating conversation, for the inspiration, the great insights and um, ideas and uh, advices. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, if you found this event interesting and, and useful, we do have more um, virtual meetups lined up for you for the next uh, months. So I would, I would just say, um, stay tuned and follow us on the Global Female Leaders um, social media channels. As you can see on the screen, if you, yes, as you can see on the screen, um, you can find us and follow us on Facebook and Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and um, also do pay a visit to the website. And if you could subscribe to the newsletter to stay up to date. Thank you and um, see you soon and bye-bye.